So my job was to convince companies to write Mac software and to create Mac hardware. Uh, after that stint at Apple, I started some software companies. I became a writer and a speaker. I uh, co-founded Garage with uh, Bill Riker, uh, which started out as a venture capital investment bank and ended up as a venture capital firm. Um, today, I work for a company called Canva out of Sydney, Australia, which is an online graphics design firm. Um, think of it as a fast, free, and easy version of Photoshop. And so basically, we enable you to create great designs faster than. Uh, so I'm that. I'm Chief Evangelist of Canva. I'm on the board of trustees of Wikimedia, which is the parent organization of Wikipedia. And I'm an executive fellow at the Haas School of Business of uh, UC Berkeley. So uh, that's what I do. And uh, I think with the exception of the speakers at this conference, I like to open up my speech explaining why I use a top 10 for it. And that's because I have seen so many high tech speakers and other than the ones at this conference and Bill Riker, they pretty much all suck. Um, so that's one key element of most speakers uh, in tech. And the other key element is they go long. So if you think about it, you know, if, if your speech is short and you suck, it's okay. And if your speech is long and you're great, it's okay. But if you're long and suck, that's just a bad combination. That's like, you know, hard to use and slow. Uh, so what I use is a top 10 format so that in case you think I suck, you know about how much longer I'll suck. And I have exactly 10 key points. Uh, so these are the lessons of Steve Jobs. I work for Steve. Uh, uh, in that Macintosh division, largest collection of egomaniacs in the history of California. <laughs> we held that record for 30 years until Facebook broke it. Uh, I'll tell you, everybody wants to hear some Steve Jobs stories. So uh, one day I'm working in my queue and Steve appears with someone I've never met before and he says, what do you think of this company called Nowhere, K-N-O-W-A-R-E? Uh, it was an educational software company, Knowledgeware. And I said, well, Steve, it's kind of a mediocre company, mediocre product, drilling practice, doesn't take advantage of graphics, doesn't take advantage of the mouse, doesn't take advantage of color. So it's basically a mediocre company, crappy product. And he says, oh, guy, I want you to meet the CEO of <laughs> Noah. Um, another Steve Jobs story, so just so you know what it's like. So let's pretend this was an internal meeting, okay? All the Apple employees, all Apple employees, all Macintosh division employees. And he would not hesitate to do things like, uh, who hired him? Like, why, why, why is he still at Apple? Because we need the best players here. So who hired him? Why is he still? So he would regularly just call you out in public and just humiliate you. So I, I know, you know, you, you're all probably well versed in HR practices about how you meet with employees and you develop goals that are mutually acceptable. and. Time to time you meet with them, provide positive feedback so you know they can self-actualize these goals and, and always be positive and you know all that kind of stuff. Um, and then there's Steve Jobs who would just tell you you're a piece of shit in front of everybody you know. And so uh, contrary to every theory that you may have learned about HR, let me tell you something, fear is a very good motivator. <laughs> there's no doubt that uh, I would not be here were it not for Steve Jobs. Uh, he was a fantastic person, very difficult to work for. Every story, every movie, every book, every, everything you've heard about him is true. Um, he was fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Uh, you know, obviously he died and, um, well, the world is a lot less interesting without Steve Jobs. But I guarantee you, I absolutely guarantee you that he is telling God what to do right now. <laughs> so if you don't like Universe 1.0, hang around, because Universe 2.0 is coming soon. Uh, let's just hope there's not a John Ive explaining Universe 2.0. Um, so this is the lessons of Steve Jobs, and I think almost everyone is applicable to what you do. So the first lesson I learned is that if you are a good person, you would hire people better than you. A players hire A plus players. We found that with B players, B players hire C players and C players hire D players. So when you start hiring B players, you'll quickly be surrounded by, by Z players. This is called the bozo explosion. <laughs> you need to fight the bozo explosion. Uh, this is a picture of the Macintosh division circa 1984. Um, I'm in the far upper left corner of this picture. One of my big mistakes in my career is that I never in a million years anticipated that Apple would be so successful. 
And if I had, I would have stood in the front of this picture. <laughs> so now I'm just, you know, a few pixels in the back. Um, that is Steve there uh, on his knees in the front. That is literally the only picture you will ever see of Steve Jobs on his knees. Trust me. <laughs> at ts on their knees, Sprint's on their knees, T-Mobile's on their knees, you know. Everybody's on their knees if Steve Jobs is never on his knees. So this is the Macintosh division uh, in front of the Macintosh division building. This is the building that the Apple II division paid for but was never allowed into. Um, it's a whole story. The Apple II division came up with a story about us, or a joke about us. Is how many Macintosh division employees does it take to screw in a light bulb? The answer is one. The Macintosh division employee holds up the light bulb and expects the universe to revolve around him. <laughs> uh, there's a Microsoft version of this joke, and the Microsoft version is how many Microsoft employees does it take to screw in a light bulb? And the answer is none, because Bill Gates has declared darkness the new standard. <laughs> Second point that I learned from Steve is that contrary to all the marketing-driven theories of the world, customers cannot tell you what they need. They can only describe their future needs in terms of what they already get from you. So, if they are buying an Apple II from you, they are going to tell you we need a better, faster, cheaper Apple II. More color, more storage, faster, whatever it is. They would never ever tell you to build something like a Macintosh, which was completely incompatible. Different everything, chip, different operating system, different software, uh, different form factor, mouse space, WYSIWYG display, everything was different. And I, I learned this very valuable lesson that if you truly want to innovate, uh, you need to get to the next curve, not simply duke it out on this curve. So uh, I guess I am saying that, you know, Marketing is tricky because if you go to your current install base and ask them what they want, they're going to tell you better sameness. <laughs> and so great innovation occurs not when you listen to your customers, but when you listen to yourself. And I think that you know Macintosh reflected what Steve and a handful of engineers thought about the future of computing. It wasn't a slightly better Apple II. So as an entrepreneur, your job, believe it or not, is to anticipate what your customers will need, as opposed to asking them what they'll need. Um, you know, for Apple, you can look at Steve's success in one of two ways. One is that he could anticipate what customers would need, or he would make whatever the hell he wanted and make customers need it. Um, <laughs> I subscribe to the second theory more than the first, actually. But let's just say that Steve was, had a rare ability to do that. Not everybody can do that, but either method can work. The point is that you know, there's no scenario in which customers can tell you how to innovate to the next curve. Speaking of the next curve, uh, let us talk about curves. So uh, the example I like to use is ice. So there used to be an ice harvesting curve. This meant that in the late 1800s and early 1900s, Bubba and Junior would go to a frozen lake or a frozen pond and their technology was a horse, a sleigh, and a saw. This was a major improvement because you could harvest ice, you could sell ice to people, that ice could stay frozen and provide convenience and cleanliness for weeks, okay? This is a big deal. 30 years later, there's an ice factory curve and on the ice factory curve, now you freeze water centrally. This is even better. Now it doesn't have to be a cold season, it doesn't have to be a cold city, right? You could have an ice factory in San Francisco, you could not harvest ice in San Francisco. This is a huge difference. 30 more years go by, and now we have the refrigerator curve. This is even better. Now you're not dependent on the ice man delivering ice from the ice factory in an ice truck. You have your own refrigerator, your own ice factory, your own PC, if you will, your own personal chiller. A very interesting fact is that none of the ice harvesters became factories and none of the factories became refrigerator companies because most companies define their business in terms of what they already do. If you think you're in the business of harvesting ice, that's all you ever do. If you think you're in the business of freezing water centrally, that's all you ever do. If you think you're in the business of mechanical typewriters, you're Smith Corona or Remington Rand, most of you are too young to know who the hell these were, that's all you ever do. If you think you're in the business of applying chemicals to film so that when they're exposed to light, people can have pictures and you're Kodak, then you don't embrace digital cameras, right? And so that's what happens to most companies. They define themselves in terms of what they already do as opposed to the benefits that they provide. 
if you were Kodak, you would understand that what you provide customers is the quote Kodak moment, right? It's this preservation of these great memories. And so the preservation of great memories can happen with chemicals on, on top of film, or it can be digital. Should not matter to Kodak which one it is. But if you define your business as we slap silver, we slap chemicals on plastic, then you do not jump to the next curve, much less create the next curve. So if you want to be a successful entrepreneur, you have to get to the next curve or create the next curve. The fourth thing that I learned from Steve is that design counts. It might not count for everybody, but it counts for enough people. This is a picture of a MacBook Air. MacBook Air is a cool, thin, beautiful piece of aluminum. It looks like it was machined by Tibetan monks as they were chanting in a monastery, right? This is fantastic. How many of you have MacBook Airs? All right, so, and how many of you have like big, thick, plastic, ugly, black laptops running Windows? <laughs> <laughs> so you're the people who are pressed, right? Because nobody voluntarily buys that computer. I mean, I, I refuse to. Did I refuse to believe? So you woke up. One, let me ask you. So you woke up one morning. Said, Today's the day, baby. I'm going to buy a laptop, and I can buy this cool, thin, beautiful, hand machine, Tibetan monk-made sliver of solid aluminum awesomeness. Or I can get this thick, black, ugly, plastic piece of crap running Windows. And you said, Ah, oh, I'll get the black plastic piece of crap. Is that the, is that the decision process? Okay. Well, you know, to each his own. So. What I'm saying is that obviously design doesn't count for everybody, <laughs> but it accounts for enough people. Uh, number five is that I learned from Steve are the things that create big results. You know, with Macintosh, you could have said, well, the goal is we'll ship another computer, right? Or like we'll get 5% market share, we'll sell, you know, 100,000 a month or so. Uh, but that's not how he positioned Macintosh for the employees. He positioned Macintosh as an epic, magnificent struggle between freedom of thought and totalitarianism. It was an epic fight with IBM, and IBM represented George Orwell, 1984, thought control. <laughs> and really, this is my absolute favorite picture of Steve Jobs. So this is a picture of Steve Jobs. Flipping off IBM. <laughs> this is a great picture of Steve Jobs. Um, and we launched Macintosh with this 1984 commercial where this woman came running down this hall and threw the sledgehammer into an image of the totalitarian George Orwell 1984, um, symbolizing our battle with this kind of thought process as opposed to merely shipping another computer. It was a horrendously big goal. It wasn't about shipping a computer. It was to prevent the end of freedom of thought. It was a religious battle. Um, by the way, if you're really astute, you'd notice that this picture obviously cannot be right, cannot be a total screen dump from the original ad because she's wearing an iPod. <laughs> an iPod did not exist back then. Uh, number six, number six that I learned from Steve is less is more. Um, the most obvious place for most of you to apply this is in your pitches. Okay. Because I bet you many of you have 50 or 60 slides, right? And I also bet you that you probably heard of the Guy Kawasaki rule of PowerPoint, 10 slides, 20 minutes, 30 points, right? How many of you heard that rule before? Yeah. How many of you still have 60 slides? Yeah. Because you thought, oh yeah, Guy was talking about the hoi polloi, the great auto wash masses. Not me. I have patent pending, curve jumping, paradigm shifting way to sell dog food online. I need 60 slides, right? That's you. You're the exception, right? Okay. I can't tell you how many people come into garage and meet with Bill and I, and you know, they start off by saying, you know, Guy, we've read all your books. We love your books. Like, I have my copy of The Art of Start. You see all the dog ears. You see all the highlight. You see all the, you know, the post-it notes. So I adore your writing. I read everything you write. I like it. It's just, I worship everything you do. And then they whip out their PowerPoint and I see it's 60 slides, eight point font. I'm like, what the hell? Did you miss that chapter? Or what, what am I missing here? So, uh, but Steve truly taught me that less is more. Less is more in slides, less is more in design, less is more in everything. And a very good, just total summation of this argument is this slide. So this is a Steve Jobs slide. Big graphic. Not even his graphic, Windows graphic, my God. <laughs> iTunes, 200 point font, the best Windows app ever written, 90 point font, right? There's like six words on this slide, six words. 
But you know exactly what he wants to say. You know the message. It doesn't say patent pending, curve jumping, paradigm shifting, <laughs> enterprise class, scalable. It doesn't say strategic. It doesn't use the word partnership. It doesn't say world class, proven team. Like half the words you probably use are, are wiped out from this kind of slide, all right? This is the slide. Now, by contrast, there's this slide. This is a Bill Gates slide. <laughs> Make a choice. Make a choice right now. You know, stand up and be counted. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Both people are billionaires. Both people achieve worldwide domination of something, right? So both people highly successful. I can't, successful. I can't tell you that just because you use a clean slide, it don't mean you'll succeed. That's not true, because all of you would then switch to clean slides. But I gotta tell you, man, it just, it helps when less is more. I mean, I, seriously, look at that slide. I mean, what's the message there? I don't know, I really don't know. I've looked at that slide for hours. I know there's a message. It's like a, it's like a, um, it's like some kind of, what's those books written about the Vatican and you look at that and there's a special symbol in there that Da Vinci put in there and it's a code in there and it shows you where the national treasure is in there someplace. So, okay, again, you know, if you can have a crappy slide like this and a great product and overcome the slide, don't get me wrong, right? But I don't think you should wake up in the morning other than this guy. I don't think you should wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to make a shitty slide because that's what's going to make me successful. Number seven. Number seven is that many people believe that changing your, so your mind is a sign of weakness or stupidity, right? Like we were wrong. Can't admit that. We don't want to tell shareholders that. We don't tell our customers that. My God. But what I learned from Steve is that quite the contrary. Changing your mind is a sign of intelligence. So let me show you a total Apple 180 degree flip flop. When the iPhone was introduced, it came out with this statement. Our innovative approach using Web 2.0 based standards lets developers create amazing new applications while keeping their iPhone, keeping the iPhone secure and reliable. Let me translate what that says. That says if you want to add any kind of apps to an iPhone, first version of an iPhone, it has to be a Safari plugin. That's what that says. Mm. Okay? Because you want to keep your phone secure and reliable. One might logically ask the question, well, Steve, if a phone has to be secure and reliable, how come a Macintosh doesn't have to be secure and reliable? Anybody can write an app for a Macintosh. Nobody posed that question. Anyway, so when Apple came out with this, all the experts, you know, all the tech experts, the tech journalists, everybody said, oh, Steve, we are freaking not worthy. We are not worthy. You are so right. Close that iPhone system. Protect us. Absolutely, Steve, you're doing the right thing. A year goes by. Apple executives to showcase Mac OS X Leopard and OS X iPhone development platforms at the Worldwide Developer Conference 2018. <laughs> Let me translate this for you. This is saying now we have a software developer's kit. You can write any kind of software you want for an iPhone. This is a 180 degree reversal, right? And all the experts said, oh, Steve, you are so right. Open architecture is a way to go. We are not worthy again. <laughs> you might ask the logical question, how can Steve be right twice? <laughs> and he said the opposite thing. That's the power of Steve Jobs, reality distortion for you. But when I saw this example, I said, my God. You know, nobody remembers Steve. You're such a hypocrite. You're full of shit. You lied to us last year. Everybody said, Steve, you're so right. You're so right. So some of that was the reality distortion. Don't get me wrong. But some of it was the realization that Steve Jobs was smart enough and he was brave enough and he had enough confidence to reverse himself. To reverse himself. And the rest is history, right? In a sense. I mean, now, iPhone. How many of you have iPhones in this audience? Yeah. You don't have an iPhone. So you got the black on the thing. Your slides suck and you're using Android. Or is that a more rural flip phone? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I gotta tell you, honestly, just between you and I, don't tell anybody outside this room, I think there are many aspects of Android that are better than iOS. Um, I, um, I love Android. Uh, the reason why I cannot use an Android phone is because there's one app that I have to use. It's called Facebook Mentions. And Facebook mentions is only iOS, and only 1,200 people in the world can use it. It's it's uh, only for verified public figures. But if you use Facebook mentions, all your comments zoom to the top wherever you comment, 
And uh, right now we're doing a live Periscope slash Meerkat like thing on that phone over there, which is my phone, but we're doing it through Facebook. So only about 1,200 people in the world can do that, and it's because of Facebook mentions. And so um, that's the killer app for me because so much of my world is dependent on social media. But if, if Facebook mentions were an Android, I would switch back, really. I'd switch back. Okay, anyway, where was I? Number, number eight. Number eight is, you know, Steve had a great appreciation for user interface and a great appreciation for fantastic programming and fantastic hardware design. Because fundamentally, he did not view engineers as tools and means to an end. He viewed software and hardware design as art, and therefore engineers are artists. I really do believe that. Engineers are artists. This is a picture of Burl Smith, musician and hardware designer. You know, he didn't have a computer science PhD from Carnegie Mellon, MIT, or Stanford. He was found in the Apple II repair department. That's where he came from. He was an artist. And I have great respect for people who can write software and design on it. Truly, it is an art. Number nine. Number nine is all the marketing that you really need to know. Okay? You don't need to get an MBA. You don't need to take any class. You don't need to go online. This is it. This is it, baby. Okay. Very simple, uniqueness or you know, sort of differentiation on the vertical axis, on the horizontal axis is value. This is a two by two matrix. How many of you have any experience with McKinsey at all? Worked with McKinsey, used McKinsey, anything like that? Well, let me burst your bubble, okay? So if you use McKinsey for something like this, they're gonna charge you $2 million to tell you you need to be in the upper right hand corner. <laughs> That's it. That's it. I save you two million bucks right there, okay? So let's go through all corners. The bottom right corner is a corner where you produce something of value, but it is not different. You slap the same Windows operating system on the same Toshiba hard drive using the same Samsung monitor. It's all same. You have to compete on price. It can be done, as Michael Dell has shown. You can make billions of dollars there, but it's always about the price. In the opposite corner is the corner where you have produced something that only you do. You have cornered the market there, okay? Only you do this, but there is no market. You own a market that doesn't exist. In that corner, you are just plain stupid. <laughs> the bottom left corner is even worse. The bottom left corner is what I call the dot-com corner. And in the dot-com corner, we have the mother of all stupidity, which is you have a product that is not unique and it is of no value. I, I think looking back with hindsight, which is always perfect, you know, one of the, one of the challenges of Pets.com was I think it was in this corner, right? So Pets.com was a way to buy dog food online. So why was it not unique? Well, let me give you the pitch. This may sound vaguely familiar to your pitch. <laughs> 300 million Americans, right? Tracking with me so far, you dumb VCs? 300 million Americans. One in four owns a dog. That's 75 million dogs. Each dog eats two cans of dog food per day. That's 150 million cans of dog food total addressable market per day. And dogs eat 365 days a year. <laughs> this is not some boring B2B market with long sales cycles that take the weekend off. This is B2C, or more accurately, B2D. <laughs> and so, with my rock star programmers, because no entrepreneur ever hired a lousy programmer, Every programmer in a startup is a rock star. With my rock star Python, HTML5, Java programmers, how hard could it be to get 1%, a mere 1%? You could freaking fall off a log and get 1%. So you fall off a log in this market and you get 1%. 1% of 150 million per day is 1.5 million cans of dog food per day. My God. 
Again, conservatively speaking, worst case. <laughs> One and a half million cans of dog food per day times 365 is like 500 million cans of dog food. Worst case, conservatively speaking. <laughs> Hallelujah, right? Where do I sign the term sheet? <laughs> so there was pets.com, mypets.com, peapodpets.com, safewaypets.com, webpetspets.com. There are like 16 ways to buy dog food online. Because 150 million cans of dog food per day. My God, what a great market. So that answers why it wasn't unique. Now, why wasn't it valuable? It wasn't valuable because the dog food business is really quite simple. It is supply chain management, okay? So you have a cow and you have a dog. <laughs> you need to get the cow, kill it, cut it in pieces, put it in a can, get it to the dog. <laughs> this is not rocket science, okay? This is not curing cancer. This is not ending global warming. This is not uh, cold fusion. Simply getting pieces of dead cows in cans to people. So if you look at this supply chain, why? Why on earth is there a pet food store in this supply chain? What true value does that thing add to people enjoy getting in their cars, driving to the pet food store, finding parking, going outside, going to the point of purchase, performing this intellectual point of purchase, rational consumer decision? Do they look at the back of the can to look at the contents? Do they perform a taste test? And for crying out loud, we're talking about dead cows in cans, okay? And so the pet food store really provides very little value. So let's eliminate the pet food store. Hallelujah. So at the second highest line on the invoice, you know, there's revenue, there's the sales price, and then there's this like 20% discount because now there's no more retail mouth to feed. Hallelujah. The problem is, at the second to the last line, there's this thing called shipping and handling. Because without the pet food store, guess what? The dead cow in the can is still in the factory. We gotta get it to Rocky, the dog. So now we have to add in shipping and handling. So you took off 20 at the top, you add 20 back at the bottom, and then somebody had to be at home when UPS dropped off the dead cow in the can. So it was less convenient, just as expensive, and there were 16 ways to do this. That's pets.com, that's the dot-com corner. That's the worst corner of all. So the corner you wanna be in is in the upper right-hand corner. In that upper right-hand corner, you know, you have something unique and valuable. When the iPod first came out, if you wanted a good selection of music, very easy to download, and inexpensive, and legal, guess what? It was iPod and iTunes. That was the only game in town. This is the Breitling Emergency Watch. So with this watch, if I unscrew this knob and pull it out, there is an antenna. This antenna broadcasts an emergency signal that airplanes catch. So if you do this, next thing you know, Kevin Costner is in the Coast Guard helicopter <laughs> and they're dropping him down in the wire basket to come get you. Okay, that's how this watch works. So this is not something you do, oh, I took 280 instead of 101, I'm lost, let's pull out the watch, okay? <laughs> this is something you do when you're, you know, you're, you're adrift outside the bay and you're about to die. Or you, you went skiing and like an idiot, you went off the trail and now you're lost and you're gonna freeze to death. This watch can save your life. There's not many watches that can save your life, you know? If you're in that situation, this is a very unique and valuable watch. This is a smart car, which came from Mercedes to the United States a few years ago. So we all have cars. We can all park parallel to the curb, right? No problem. How about when there's not a lot of parking? How many of us can park perpendicular to the curb? <laughs> Unique and valuable. The 10th thing that I learned from Steve is that you need to learn to ignore naysayers. Naysayers. Naysayers, bozos, clowns, whatever you want to call them. You need to learn to ignore those people. They're going to tell you it can't be done, it shouldn't be done, it isn't necessary. I'm an expert at this. I call this bozosity. There are two <laughs> kinds of bozos in the world. One bozo, slovingly disgusting, body odor, pocket protector, you know, hair growing out of his ears, Japanese watch, rusty car. You look at that person and say, wow, you are a loser, right? This is not the dangerous bozo because Unless you're a loser, you would never listen to a loser. Only li losers listen to losers. Hence, because you're not losers, not dangerous. We don't even need to discuss this guy anymore. The dangerous bozo is a bozo who's a winner. What are the outward trappings of a winner? Dresses in all black, facial hair, messenger bag, 
skinny jeans, and owns a lot of things that end in I, Armani, Maserati, Brioni, Lamborghini, Ferrari. Audi is an exception. Audi is okay. <laughs> so you look, you, are you own an Audi? So, <laughs> so you look at this person, you think, my God, rich and famous must be smart, right? But I, I gotta tell you, like, man, I look at this, I say, rich and famous, 50% of the time seems to parse to lucky, not smart. So you have to be very careful of the dangerous, successful bozo. Because you're going to be so tempted to listen to that person. It, at an extreme, you know, you might say, wow, I should listen to Tom Cruise about spiritual issues. <laughs> right? I mean, rich and famous and good looking. Why would I not believe Tom Cruise about spiritual issues? As far as raising a family, Kim Kardashian. Rich and famous. Why don't I listen to Kim Kardashian about family values? No. So, I, I think that bozosity, cluelessness, stupidity, is a disease. It's like the flu. And how do we fight the flu? We fight the flu by getting a shot. You go to Walgreens or you go to CVS and you get a shot. And what's in that shot? It's a little bit of flu, so that when you encounter big flu, you're already prepared. So I'm gonna give you some shots of stupidity and bozosity. Someday, when some rich, famous bozo tells you can't be done, shouldn't be done, isn't necessary, you think about this. You say, I remember that slide guy showed me with that rich, famous bozo said it couldn't be done and he was so wrong, right? I'm going to inoculate you right now. Okay, so I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. Thomas Watson, chairman of IBM, said this in 1943. IBM anticipated five computers in the world. Huh. I have five Macintoshes in my house. I have all the computers in the world. Come to my sometime. I'll show them all to you. This telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. Western Union Internal Memo, 1876. 1876, Western Union wrote off telephony. How many of you have used Western Union lately? Huh. How about you? <laughs> Your Bitcoin, right? That's right. With all the money you make on Bitcoin, why don't you buy a decent computer? <laughs> so, you know, maybe the strategic direction for Western Union in 1876 was let's teach Americans the Morse code. How hard could that be? Morse code ain't that hard. We string telegraph into every house. And we got a really big spool of wire. We string, you know, telegraph wire behind the horseless carriage. Why not? So, you know, it's very hard to go from Telegraph to Bitcoin, telegraph to PayPal, telegraph to Square, if you write off telephone first. As Jeffrey Moore would say, the chasm is too big to cross. There's no reason why anyone would want a computer in their home. Ken Olson, founder of DEC, fantastic innovator, fantastic startup, fantastic entrepreneur. And yet he could not embrace the personal computer. So right now, many people are advising you, you need to get blue ribbon advisors, right? Directors, investors, people who add value. And so they said, look for someone with relevant industry experience, someone who can bring street cred to your startup. So imagine this is 1977 and you're starting Apple. Like who would be a better advisor, investor, or director than Ken Olson? My God, the creator of Dick. So, you and Waz, you take your Volkswagen van, you drive to Las Vegas, and you go to Comdex or CES or something, and you know, you go into Caesar's Palace and you get into an elevator, and lo and behold, my God, the gods are smiling upon you today, and there's Ken Olson in the elevator. And you say, Mr. Olson, we know who you are. We have a different idea for computers. We think computers should be small. They should be cheap. They should be easy to use, Mr. Olson. So small, so cheap, so easy to use, Mr. Olson, that people could have computers in their homes, Mr. Olson. Can you imagine? People could have computers in their houses. 
250 Ameri million Americans, just imagine, you could put a computer into every house, it's 250 million total addressable market. We only got 1% of that, Mr. Olson. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Olson would say, son, son, let me tell you how it is, son. There is no reason why anyone would want a computer in their home. If they want to do things like balance their checkbook, they will get in their car, they will drive back to the office, and they will use Quicken running on a Dick mini computer. You are trying to serve a market that doesn't exist. So rather than piss away all your talent, why don't you learn to program COBOL and come work for me? <laughs> and there would be no Apple. There would be no Apple. This is the height of dangerous velocity. So no matter what industry you're in, you're probably thinking, man, there's like this perfect investor out there with credibility has done it before. And that's the dangerous one. Because they're going to tell you, it can't be done, it shouldn't be done, it isn't necessary. You know, we sold through retail stores, you can't sell direct. Or we sold direct, you can't sell through retail stores. When Apple created the Apple Store, go read all the press that happened right around then. Every retail expert said, no can do. You cannot support one company's product in a store. People want to go to large box companies, Best Buy, you got all this selection. There's no way you could have an Apple store on Madison Avenue, the most expensive real estate in the world, open 24 hours. Are you on crack? How could you have an Apple store on Madison Avenue in New York? That's dangerous bozosity. Don't let the bozos grind you down. And the 11th thing that I learned from Steve is that contrary, contrary to what you may have heard, because what you probably heard is that some things need to be seen to be believed. If you are an entrepreneur, some things need to be believed to be seen. People believe in your product, believe in your service, believe in your team, believe in your product. They believe enough, then everything will coalesce and you will be a reality. Macintosh, it was my job to make people believe in Macintosh before it was real. Evangelism comes from Greek words of bringing the good news. And bringing the good news is very different from sales. The difference between evangelism and sales is that a salesperson has his or her quota, commission, spreadsheet, budget, profitability, quarterly bonus. The salesperson has his or her best interests at heart, worrying about her quota, her commission. An evangelist has the other person's best interests at heart. When I evangelized Macintosh, it was good, yes, it was good if people developed for Macintosh and bought Macintosh, but truly, from the bottom of my heart, I tell you, I was truly, truly convinced that I was evangelizing something to them that was in their best interest because Macintosh would make people more creative and more productive. So I was looking out for their best interests. That's the difference between evangelism and sales. And when you have a product that can be evangelized because it is a leap to the next curve, then you will have to get people to believe in it before they can see it. In a sense, this is called Guy's Golden Touch. So Guy's Golden Touch, contrary to what you might think, is not that whatever I touch turns to gold. <laughs> Quite frankly, that's just not true. Guy's Golden Touch is whatever is gold, Guy touches. <laughs> the key to evangelism, the key to evangelism is to evangelize something great. It's very easy to evangelize great stuff. It is very hard to sell crap. Okay. So some things need to be believed to be seen. And I, I dug up this headline. Apple, the first $700 billion company. For a while, Apple was the most valuable company in the world. It's always in that top five right now. Like, I'll tell you something, in 1987, if you had told me this would be true in 2014 or 15, I would have told you you're crazy. If you had told me this, in 2005, I would have told you you're crazy. If you told me this in 1995, I would have told you you're crazy. I'm the stupid guy who left Apple twice. If I had not left Apple either of those times, I would not be here right now. <laughs> so, you know, I'm as stupid as anybody else, right? But truly, 
Apple pulled it off. Apple did pull it off and it's because people believed. And I gotta show you just one last slide. Um, I am today evangelizing a different product or service and this is called Canva. How many of you already use Canva? Hopefully some of you do. Okay, so Canva is an online graphic design service. I promise you it makes fantastic graphics. Social media, book covers, album covers, infographics, presentations, whatever you need, cover photos, whatever you want. Um, I, I believe we passed out the card. Did we pass out the card? Did you get a room yeah. card? Yeah. yeah. So that card, you know, Canva has stock photography built in. You can use your own photos and not pay us anything, or you can use our stock photos. They're a dollar each. So that card entitles you to 10 photos. It's a $10 card. Right? So you can give me a $10 bill. So please try Canva. I promise you, I promise you that you'll make beautiful graphics so fast. And I, I also promise you, because I'm so active in social media, every post you make in social media needs to have a graphic. It will double or triple your engagement right there. So you need to make graphics. You need to make graphics in your newsletters, in your email letters, your IAB, medium rectangle ads, everything. Just try Canva, okay? That's all I ask, just try Canva. And that, those are the lessons of Steve Jobs. May you live long and prosper. Thank you very much.